please welcome John McLean. John, the floor is yours. Thanks, Michael. So what you're going to see you know, uh, this morning is actually engineers' charts. So you're going to see a slightly different format and style. So I apologize for that to start with. Uh, I thought it was interesting this morning when Catalina said, uh, you know, we have to think about the youth of today differently. And it made me reflect on a story uh, with my son who, when he was at school, hacked the school Citrix server and was running a game system in the back with one of his friends, unknown to the school. So when they were meant to be in science class, they were actually playing games. So I was clearly called into the school to reprimand, you know, because he was being reprimanded. And I was somewhat conflicted as an engineer because part of me sort of said, oh, that's actually pretty cool. But as a father, I couldn't say, that's pretty cool. I had to reprimand him. So I might apologize to him tonight uh, when I talk to him on FaceTime because um, he still mentions it occasionally. I thought this was pretty cool, Dad, and you're kind of telling me off. Now, he is 22, 23 now, and uh, working in software like his dad, which is ominous. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about blockchain, as, as Mikhail said. And I think it's important to understand the context in which you know, you all operate. You know, no business is an island. And we've, we've had this whole thing on trust, how important it is to have trust. And when you look about the disparate nature of the world you play in, there's multiple counterparties, multiple organizations in this world. And it really is a broad network. You know, I'm showing a bank here, but this could be a distribution network, the automotive uh, industry network. You know, when you look at cars now, you buy a car, you lease a car, you deal with the DMV or the, the government authority that controls it as it goes through its life cycle all the way through getting scrapped. And it's an incredibly complicated world. And candidly, there's no trust in that world. So what we argued uh, around blockchain, and this is why blockchain is so interesting, right, is it's this idea of a, a way of having uh, a ledger. Right? Um, shared replicated permission is certainly the thing we've been focused on. And we see this as an underpinning piece of technology. You know, I, 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 I hesitate to say the word like TCP IP, but we see blockchain as a fundamental thing. And as a result of that, you know, the work we've been doing is, is, is been with the Hyperledger Foundation, uh, which is uh, under the Linux um, banner. So we're working the open source, open community, because we believe this is a core piece of technology that really should be available and accessible to all, where multiple parties can participate and play in this. And we're seeing great industry adoption across tech and business playing and participating in this, this private permission blockchain world. And it really is all about looking at transactions, those asset flows, depending on what that asset is, right? And extensively, we're talking about physical assets. You know, it could be cars, diamonds, antiques. It could be bonds, securities. It could be intellectual assets, patents, wills, license agreements, right? It could be medical health records, data that we own, data that we care about, data that we want to control. So think about that world. We're transferring, transacting assets that we all play in. And we have this way of sharing that data and information across this world and ledger. And we're doing it with the open community. Really interesting. And an example of this is a project you know, we've been doing with WeTrade. And I'm showing you the WeTrade uh, charts. Look at the first kind of banner. More trust, more trade. They've done this because their view is this is the problem they have. And again, this is their charts. This is a project we've worked with them on. It's a, a live blockchain consortia network. Well, bank estimates up to 50% of small, medium businesses do not have access to finance. So what does that ultimately mean when we start talking in crude terms about trust? What it means is if you want to be a buyer and seller across those borders and there is no trust, you can either accept the risk, you can insure against that risk, or you don't do the business. Because the seller doesn't have in access to invoice financing, right? So what do you do? So this is a huge inhibitor. So what we're seeing here is a consortia of banks, and it's really important to understand 
this is a, a consortia. It's a, a number of the uh, players in Europe that you can see up here who are trading in near real time information and, and financing agreements because it gives them the ability to build trust in that network. So the one thing we've been kind of talking about is how do you build trust in industrial sense? So this is a live example running today, but it kind of gives you the view. It is about we trade, more trust, more trade. And I think that's a, an interesting way of viewing the problem. So clearly blockchain can help with that world, build trust. And one of the things we've also seen is this idea of transfer of assets within that business community, within that business consortium network. And then we started thinking about it in the open community, you know, when we started to work on this Hyperledger project from an engineering perspective. And then we started thinking about identity in that world of trust. So let's look at some of the facts. Cyber attacks, 400 billion a year. Banks spend a billion just on identity management solutions. Just in the US, 172 million records breached last year. You know, that's a staggering statistic. And these are ever increasing, ever more prevalent. And when you say, why don't you know, my children who are 24 and, and 23 trust large consortia, large groups, it's down to this kind of thing, right? They're also very conscious of being monetized. I, I, my, mine are right at the border between the, the, the two kind of generations that Catalina talked about, but I find it interesting. Neither of them use Snapchat anymore, neither of them use Facebook anymore. They are out of that social media world. Their whole relationships are point to point with their peers. They use technology, but they care about who has access to their data, who has access to their information, and what they're doing with it. I would say they're far more aware, far more savvy than potentially we give them credit for. I, I have always said to them, you know, if you're not paying for something, you are the product. And they've really taken that on board, but it's not just them, it is their generation. So what's the problem? Candidly, online identity systems are pretty broken. Individuals and organizations are, are you know, they want to kind of control own our identity, but then we have this whole honey, honeypot issue um, that the hackers really just want to target. And it's like, a, it's like an arms race, right? If there's a target we try and secure, and then they'll find something else, and we'll try and secure again. And we've just got to be very conscious. If you paint a big target, you make a massive opportunity on something, if they can get there, they'll work pretty hard against it. And what we're starting to see is, you know, enterprises and, and traditional data aggregators uh, realize this shift uh, is underway because it's costly, there's huge liability involved, and they're losing trust, right? So what are clients saying? What we're starting to see now is people want to control their own data. They want to control their own identity. They want to decide how they're going to be monetized. And that's just a reality of the industry today. And what they say is, we need trusted partners. Yeah, we've got to play. But how do you help me control my stuff, control my data? So. When you start thinking about identity, you have to think about it in a number of ways. You know, there's my identity, there's traits associated with that, individual, you know, personal identification. We've then got identity uh, renderings, passports, driver's licenses, etc., that are provided often by government agencies or third parties or banks or whatever. And then we've also got identity interactions when we pay. I, I'm seeing again, I, I, I keep referencing my children. They want anonymity of what they bought, what, where, and when. It's quite interesting. Um, because they don't want to be targeted, they don't want to be mined, they don't want people to have that view and perception or judge them, right? So what we're seeing is this kind of identity problem 
and, and where we're starting to see the emergence with blockchain and the sort of blending of these things together. So we used to have this idea of user, user control very low, it's centralized, centralized authorities control my identity, my information, my data. We then came up with this idea of federated identity, then up to user centric. And what we're now starting to see is this idea of self sovereign. I retain control, I decide who gets to see what, where, and when on my terms and my conditions. So one of the things we're working with um, is another open community called the Sovereign Identity Network. And again, it's this idea of pushing uh, information to the edge of that network, cryptographic point-to-point -point exchange of identity. Right? Every person, organization will have a digital wallet. You know, think of it as a, a key ring with your identity tokens on that. And it's a decentralized approach to governing and managing trust. Okay. And once again, you know, we're doing this with the open community. As I said, we did the base reference implementation for blockchain, you know, for this idea of private permission network with the Linux Foundation. And this is where the open community is, you know, fantastically liberating and and you know interesting, right? Because the marketplace decides, the marketplace decides what areas to work on, what projects to work on. And one of the things that spun out as an adjunct uh, in the Hyperledger project is this idea of uh, Hyperledger Indie. If people are interested in this, you know, a lot of people say, well, John, can I come and work with you on blockchain? I'm like, yeah, just go work with the Linux Foundation. You can sign up, you can participate and play. That's the beauty of it. And what we've seen here is this idea of Hyperledger Indie is all around the idea of managing identity, self-sovereign identity underpinned by blockchain technologies. And really, it has three you know, basic, simple ideas, right? One is this decentralized identifier, user-owned, governed, gives you the ability to do self-sovereign identity, fully under control of the individual, or an organization, if you deem them fit enough or institution to control those different identity views. Could be a government agency, could be a bank, could be a telco, could be anybody, right? And it's a standardization around those universal identifiers so we can actually collaborate and play across different networks, different views. And I'll pick on the automotive industry and, and the car life cycle because we've done a huge amount of work on that one. But think about when you buy and sell and lease a car, you're dealing with the leasing agency, the manufacturer, the dealership, you're dealing with the full life cycle of that, you're often dealing with banks, insurers, maintenance companies, and they all have a different view and lens on, on both the asset, but also you as an individual. You also want to be able to do something in the world. I know it doesn't matter for any of us in this room because we're not of this generation. But my children, when they go to a bar, still have to show and prove ID. So why, when my daughter walks into a nightclub, does she have to show a driving license? Because the driving license doesn't just say how old you are. It gives all your name, date of birth, where you live, and other personal information. All she wants to be able to do is go to a club, show them a verifiable claim, verifiable fact, and that is she is over 21 and that the club can validate that with a third party and say, yep, she is over 31, that's fine. Because what we do today is, you know, it's like uh, we take our passports, lots of pieces, and people say, oh, I need a full copy of your passport. Think about all the information that's on that. Why do you have to share masses of amount of information to validate a claim, this idea of verifiable claim, credentials or claims? And we also get the other nice thing, which is this idea of decentralized key management, right? We basically have an identity key ring, right? Where we can just uh, use those public keys to unlock certain facts and interact with different organizations, right? So these are the three core concepts, right? And I'd encourage you to have a look at them. But what does this really mean in, in, in reality? We've got an issue, right? who says, I'm going to issue a credential, I'm going to sign a credential. 
You've got the holder, the individual who countersigns, say, yep, I am who I am. And then you've got a verifier, presents credentials to the verifier, and the verifier signs and, and authenticates. So let's pick an example. Uh, and this is somewhat poignant. I, I didn't make this one up. A colleague of mine made these up. But this is interesting to me because my daughter actually started as a doctor uh, two and a half months ago. So this is exactly the process. Okay? University says, you are now a doctor. Right? She issues the credentials to my daughter. She sits there and goes, I'm a doctor. She countersigns the credentials. And then she has to present them to the hospital. Because think how we do that today. How do we validate and verify facts in that network today? It's incredibly complicated without this. We're talking about shipping documents around, getting people to countersign. We're talking about um, this whole idea of notaries. I mean, when I moved to the US and went to the US, I, I didn't know a notary existed, right? I believe they're still available today, right? So. It's people coming in as third parties, validating, countersigning, saying, yeah, you're John, you, yeah, you are the person that looks like on your photograph and is on your passport and everything else. Think about the digital age and how you're going to do that cross borders with multiple parties, right? And it scales to any number of credentials. Because not only does my daughter have to present her information to the hospital, she's then had to present it to the bank saying, hey, you know what, I'm actually getting paid. And by the way, hospital, can you actually just deal directly with my bank and pay me and make sure it goes into my account? And then you start talking about things like government agencies getting involved. It becomes a really interesting and complicated process. You know, you've got doctors, you've got the universities, you've got the government agencies saying, yep, I, I issue credentials. Yeah, you can do prescriptioning. You have actually passed your medical boards. You've continued to do your personal education, your license hasn't lapsed. Yes, you've got medical insurance. It's a fully extensible model we see here. So it's this idea around decentralized identity and identity management. And it's all about driving up trust and privacy in a distributed business network. And as I said at the beginning, I contend you all participate in a distributed business network. Everybody does, right? Be it in your personal life with the government and the government agencies you interact with. But I guarantee in industry, all industries operate in a, in a private permission network. And it, it's just something to, to, to view on. It, candidly, the DIDS idea and concept is just an extension of, you know, standard decentralized PKI. But it's a really nice extension to that, leveraging blockchain as a technical underpinning to make this a reality. Now, one thing to kind of get you really excited, is so, and we said, you know, one of the things that we can do with this is this idea of ZKPs. It's a bit of a, a buzzword, zero knowledge proof, right? And this is this idea where you can assert facts, right, without actually having to share data and information that could potentially compromise other information you don't want shared. So. What are we doing? We're working with the open community. We see blockchain, as I said, you know, when we first started on this journey, uh, and I was one of the first engineering teams running on this. I was on one of the first engineering teams running on this. You know, we had this whole debate, do we build, own, or do we participate and play in the open community? And when we started running around this theme and topic, open wins, right? You get the innovation agenda, you get the client focus, you get the industry interest. The marketplace will always decide where a technology is going to go, right? And at the rate and pace that the marketplace desires and wants. And clearly, identity and identity solutions, this issue of trust in business networks is central. So again, we're working with the open community, you know, back under the Hyperledger banner. Uh, we're a key member, but again, it's the other things as well with the sovereign group, diff around the decentralized identity work. And if you're interested in this theme and topic around trust, because this is an incredibly, you know, I look at the challenges we've been talking about the last couple of days around trust and the absence of trust. This is kind of an antidote to that. 
Think about the ability to control your medical information. Deciding which doctor gets to see your genome data, medical imaging information, as you go through a treatment path. Because candidly, if you break your leg, why does your doctor need to see your genome data? You can actually compartmentalize your data, decide what they get to see, when, and how. And when you finish your treatment program, you can remove access. And candidly, that's what the younger generation expect and want. They want to be able to see things and control data in near real time. So things I'd encourage you to think about as you look on your blockchain journey, get started. And the reason I touched on the WeTrade project, it's a great project. We, you know, we're incredibly excited and proud about it. But it's this idea of building trust. We're then now extending that idea and metaphor to start looking at using blockchain and this idea of distributed identity and identity management and self-sovereign identity. So I'd encourage you to start looking at this, participate, log into the, the Hyperledger project, have a look at what people are doing. You know, there's over 250 industrial members now contributing and, and playing, and, and they're big companies, both tech and business. Banking, Airbus are playing, Mercedes, a number of others. Look at what you can do around your business network and uh, play that innovation agenda. Because I said this morning, if you can drive up trust, you can start playing the innovation around some of these long-running business processes that, candidly, we can't re-engineer, we can't modify because there's no trust. So we're seeing this as a real accelerant to the innovation agenda that we've continued to work in since I started in the, the industry a long time ago. With that, thanks for your time. Happy to take any questions at the, uh, at the break. So, John, thank you very much. So, um, I was almost in time as well. Yeah, very good, very good, very good. Thank you. So, uh, technology providing trust. That's what we are talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then when you implement this technology, how much is actually of the effort involved in the technology itself and how much is in the governance or the management or the collaboration networks that you have to create to do this? How much of the effort goes into that? Is it like 80-20 or is it 20-80? Where, where, how much of it is technology and how much of it is not technology but governance things? And like that? So, we, so governance and, the, and the, the formation of that network, how you're going to on and off board people, you know, how different participants play, is always the challenge, right? Mm. But you know, I'd say if you look at any of the integration stuff we've done around EDI and supply chain management, ERP, they're, they're massive kind of governance and process challenges. I think the interesting for us is, you know, the work we've been doing has been fundamentally looking at getting that blockchain infrastructure, you, you know, you could say that, that plumbing going and being available uh, and run on any infrastructure that you desire, be it our cloud, somebody else's cloud or your own infrastructure so you can participate and play. But yeah, governance of any project is critical. Um, I would say probably 80-20, you know, when you say governance, it's the infrastructure and deployment characteristics and management. You know, what we'd say in a project is, can I make blockchain work? Sure, I mean, we could make blockchain work with any technology four years ago, right? Um, the challenge is having the management infrastructure uh, and the tools and the capabilities to, to run that real network in a distributed sense. So could I stand a, a network up, a, a blockchain server, and trade something? Sure. You know, we've been able to do that yeah. years ago. The challenge is how do you stand up a robust enterprise grade okay. infrastructure? So when I introduce you, just before that, I asked a question from the audience. And I think that I was actually surprised by the, by the, by the answer, right? Where I asked, is blockchain underhyped, just enough hyped or, or overhyped? And I think only 26% of the people said it's Overhyped, mm -hmm. and the rest said it's just enough, and 42% said it's underhyped. Did that surprise you? Um, no, because uh, I would still argue that I didn't do a show of hands, and I usually do uh, when I when I talk, because I ask people how many people have stood up a blockchain infrastructure, how many people think they understand what it really means, 
And I did it at Olympia, I was doing it, it was about 400 people in a room. And, you know, the reality is when I ask a show of hands, I would say it's still the majority of people don't understand it, right? And I think people know some of the basics, but I certainly think they see the vision and they can certainly start seeing some of the use cases. And I think that's what's mm. exciting people. So they it's that, the potential. It's the vision. They see, you know, I've been in the tech game 35 years, right? Um, this is the first time I've had CEOs, CFOs, want to talk to me about a bit of tech. It's the first time a bit of tech's been on the front of The Economist, on the front of the Financial Times. It's a, it's a different beast. Mm. And that makes it you know, really interesting to work on, a privilege, right? Okay, John, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you.